So I want to start off this homily with C.S. Lewis from his uh, famous book, The Screwtape Letters. Raise your hand if you've read that. I'm curious. A lot of hands, at least a dozen or more hands. So, yeah, this is a great little book. It's a demon writing to an underling, uh, mentoring another demon uh, and teaching him, instructing him through these letters uh, how to win this man's soul that's been entrusted to this, uh, this demon named Wormwood. So his uncle Screwtape is writing him letters, uh, kind of mentoring him on how to do this effectively. So it was a really difficult book for C.S. Lewis to write, actually, because he had to flip himself upside down and think like the evil one, think like the devil. And this was really spiritually draining when he was done the book. He was exhausted from this project, but he in turn has provided us with this book packed with insight. He is a master of human nature, C.S. Lewis. And the tactics of the evil one are exposed in this book. So it's actually a really entertaining read. Uh, so here is the very first chapter. And there's lots of interesting things that relate to the readings from this. So Screwtape tells him, young Wormwood, uh, to uh, fix your man on the stream of sense experience around him and teach him to call this real life. Uh, but don't a ever let him ask the question what real means. Uh, just keep him occupied with shiny things in front of his face from the stream of immediate sense, sense experiences. Your business is to fix his attention on the stream. Now he kind of relates an anecdote from his uh, former days. I once had a patient, a sound atheist, who used to read in the British Museum. One day as he sat reading, I saw a train of thought in his mind beginning to go the wrong way. The enemy, God of course, was at his elbow in a moment. Before I knew where I was, I saw my 20 years work beginning to totter. If I had lost my head and begun to attempt a defense by argument, I should have been undone. But I was not such a fool. So I struck instantly at the part of the man which I had best under my control and suggested that it was just about time he had some lunch. The enemy presumably made the counter suggestion. You know, you never really quite hear what he says to them. That this was more important than lunch. At least, I think that's what he said. So Screwtape counters by saying, yes, yes. Um, this, is, this is far too important for lunch. Why don't you... Uh, Go get something to eat and then, you know, tackle this later with a, a fresh mind and a full stomach, which the patient brightens up considerably. And by the time I had added, much better come back later. He was already halfway to the door. And once he was in the street, the battle was won. I showed him a newsboy shouting the midday paper and a number 73 bus going past. And before he reached the bottom of the steps, I had got into him an unalterable conviction that whatever odd ideas might come into a man's head when he was shut up alone with his books, a healthy dose of real life by which he meant the newsboy and the bus was enough to show him that all that sort of thing just couldn't be true. He knew he'd had a narrow escape and he is now safe in our father's house. C.S. Lewis was an atheist himself at one point. And he was fond of saying, you better watch out what you read. If you want to maintain your atheism, be careful what you read. You got to really tread lightly. Uh, watch out. That's why he's like... Uh, showing, demonstrating that the demons, they don't want to engage in argument. 
They want to avoid that if at all possible, because once you get into that realm of argument, uh, screw tape says, the enemy can argue too. And it's better to just distract. That's the devil's number one ploy or tactic is to distract us, keep us fixated on the stream of sense experience around us, keep our heads down and give us, screw tape says, give him your man your patient, a general idea that he knows it all. A general fuzzy, hazy idea that he knows it all. We call that presumption. To presume to know things, walk around, form of pride. And it's the mother of all error, St. Thomas Aquinas says. So just keep on, you know, encouraging him uh, with this grand general idea that he knows it all. You're there to fuddle him, Screwtape says. You're there to fuddle him. From the way some of you young fiends talk, anyone would suppose it was our job to teach. I love that anti-intellectual nature of the evil one. Um, that's right, the devil doesn't want us to learn. He doesn't want to his you know uh demons to teach us anything where it's the exact opposite in the readings today it's like that whole psalms about teaching uh, teach me O oh lord the lord is constantly teaching us when we are his disciples students who are with him all the time he's teaching us all the time he instructs sinners in the way and teaches the humble his way Instructing us in the way that he should choose. Teach, instruct, teach, instruct everywhere. Make me know, make me to know thy paths, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. Teachability, to be teachable. Uh, the Lord wants to teach us. The devil doesn't want to teach us. He doesn't want us to think, really. Especially about anything important, about ultimate things. The fundamental human questions above all are dangerous to the evil one. So he wants to keep them far from our minds. What are the fundamental human questions? Where did I come from? Where are we going? What are we supposed to be doing in the meantime? Uh, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of my death? Is there life after death? Is there a God? These are fundamental human questions. The devil, above all, doesn't want us to think about those things because when we do, we lift up our head, as our Lord says. On that day, lift up your head. The devil wants our head down, fixated on the stream of sense experience around us. He doesn't want us to think about ultimate things, but our Lord does. And St. Paul does. So his... Writing to the Thessalonians, he's telling them about these things that he's instructed them in to pay attention to all these things he's instructed them. Okay, and our Lord is teaching us in that gospel uh, to pay attention and to keep our heads up and to be watchful and alert. And pray at all times that you may have strength to stand before the Son of Man. That's a jolt down our spine when we hear that. That's why I love that verse so much. Watch at all times praying that you may have strength to stand before the Son of Man. That's going to happen to every single one of us in here. There's a 100% mortality rate in this congregation today. That's a fact that we need to be struck with often to wake us up. That that will happen for every single one of us. We will stand before the Son of Man and we ought to pray that we have strength that day. Stand before Him, all of us, without mommy and daddy, without our spouse, kids, siblings, just us. Before the Son of Man. That is a reality for every single one of us that will happen one day. We need to be struck with amazement at that to wake us up. The devil doesn't want us to wake up. That's why our Lord's like, don't be drowsy. Don't be drowsy. It's like weighted down is the sense of this uh, Greek word, okay? It's like 
heaviness um, by life and our heads down, we're weighted down, just uh, not thinking. Falling asleep, that's the state of like sleeping. And we think we're so busy and occupied with all these things, running around doing this, that, and the other thing. And really the whole while, if we've lost sight of who we are, where we came from, where we're going, and what we're supposed to be doing in the meantime, what's the meaning of our being in existence? What's our purpose down here? Are we reflecting on our death and that we will stand before the Son of Man one day? These things snap us out of this hypnotized state the devil wants us to be in. It's like the children in the Wizard of Oz. Remember the wicked witch of the West? She's kind of like the devil, you know, and she wants, so she doesn't want them to get to the Emerald City. Anything she can do to stop them. So she cast a spell on the poppies, remember? Sleep! I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. Okay, sorry, I had to throw that in. Uh, I can't get up that high, but that's the best I can do. Uh, but she is, uh, that's like one of the best sticks ever, all time. Uh, <clears throat> she crushed that. Uh, roll. All right, look, she put them to sleep. Even Toto was sacked out in the, in the, you know, on the ground. And uh, that's like the devil. He, he, he doesn't, uh, he wants us to just fall asleep. So to resist that, we have to keep our head up. We have to maintain this, this contemplative heart. So just want to look at one thing. Somebody who does this really well is... Moses, um, and he counsels uh, the Israelites at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, right before he leaves them. It's like his final farewell song or prayer, prayer song. And he says, uh, talks about God, and he uses the uh, image of an eagle. And I, I just love this. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, flutters over its young spreading out its wings, catching them, burying them on its pinions. He makes them ride on the high places of the earth. It's like us down here in our little comfort zone, you know, in our nest. And it's time to fly, you know, ride on the high places of the earth. That eagle symbolizes our contemplative life where when we get up nice and high, but we, we want to keep, stay down here safe in our little nest, in our a little busy activity. We don't want to think about the fundamental human questions until we're forced to. When someone we love dies and we're at the funeral home and we just get that deer in the headlights look, I see it all the time. And people are confronted with these realities, uh, like a two by four upside the head. Uh, that's when they're shocked and horrified. We should be thinking about them all the time. They should never be far from our thinking if we are to remain awake. So God comes down. He's not going to just let us sit there in that nest, you know, and a little eaglet sitting there. Here comes mom or dad hovering over the nest. Whoa, whoosh, whoa, whoosh. Feathers are flying out, debris flying out of the nest. They're like, man, what, what's going on? I thought you was going to bring me a fish or something. And, I, and they get blown out of the nest and they grab onto their parents' back their pinions, their shoulders of their wings, and like, oh my goodness, and then they spread their wings out for the first time, and they start flying, and they learn, and follow, and go way up high, ride on the high places of the earth, that's where we have to remain in our hearts. Yes, we have to engage the world, and live in this day-to-day -day life down here, the work-a-day world, but at the same time, part of us always needs to be soaring up nice and high where we see from horizon to horizon. We never forget who we are, where we came from, where we're going. When we do that, we remain awake and we'll be ready to stand before the Son of Man.